Thank you for joining us for our webinar on retentions and an update on the ALDS bill. I'm Ruth Wilkinson, a construction partner at Clark's Legal, and I'm joined by Debbie Petford at BISA and also by Alexi Ozzyuro at BISA. Sure, so the oldest bill, if you're not familiar with it, has basically been introduced by Conservative MP Peter Aldous, he's the MP for Waveney, which is in uh, the east of the country. He introduced this bill with a view to trying to tackle the issue of retention payments and the damage it causes to the construction industry, especially to smaller subcontractors. His background is actually as a quantity surveyor, so he understands some of the issues in the industry. He's not just coming at this as a stranger or someone that uh, has been asked by a group to do it. He's done it out of his own interest and he's led with the bill having its first reading on the 9th of January, ironically six days before Carillion collapsed. But at the first reading he made it very clear that there are so many things that have changed in the industry, so many other things that still need to change in the industry and retentions is one of them. So the bill is on the website, on the Parliament website, you can go and have a look at it, you can see all of the stages of the bill, any of the relevant documents that are connected to it, and currently it's looking to get its second reading on October 26th, which after parliamentary recess, after party conference season, could be very, very interesting times. The bill so far has gotten a lot of attention. It's been noticed by all levels of politics, all levels of the media, getting national coverage, which usually something as sector specific and issue specific as this wouldn't get coverage in national media, but the oldest bill has, because Peter Aldous has been very, very shrewd and very clever with how he's been driving this forward and how it's been working to actually involve as many people in the industry and as many cross-party politicians as possible. For example, you have key members of every single party in the Labour Party, you have most of the Shadow Cabinet are on board with this and agree with it. The uh, Labour leadership have even made reference to the fact that in a new election their manifesto would reflect this kind of reform and changing the system to include more protection for small businesses. The DUP obviously have a good ear in government at the moment, they're very firmly behind this with their not so fond memories of the Lagan collapse a few years ago. In the Conservative Party at the moment with Brexit you find it very rare that you find names like Prithi Patel, Anna Subri and Ken Clark on the same list but there are over 60 Conservative MPs backing this. The Green Party, it's very rare you see the Green Party actually backing something construction oriented. The Liberal Democrats are pretty much all on board. Vince Cable obviously in his previous role as what would now be the Minister for Bays makes that quite relevant. Plaid Cymru and SNP as well because it's not just an English focused thing, it's UK wide. So with that in mind, all the different MPs, all the interesting people on board, there are currently 186 MPs backing this bill which is a very impressive number and they're all from different parties, different economic persuasions, different schools of thought. So it's very encouraging going forward to see the, how the bill is actually going to progress with this level of support behind it. At the moment it's just about keeping that support up and building it even further. As you can see from this map on the left, it's, a, it's not a regional issue. This is UK wide, it's something that affects anywhere and everywhere. There is no one constituency that can claim to not have small businesses or builders, plumbers, electricians or construction work going on, which makes it very, very relevant to the whole country. On the right is more of a planning map actually, it just shows the old mantra that political campaigns are part art, part science. And you always need to be aware of who you're trying to get on board, who's allowed to be on board, who won't, who might be opposed to this, and just trying to convince people always to um, align with what you want to do. Which seems to be working so far, especially in the industry. The industry are typically very fractured and very uh, standalone. They do their own thing, not very keen on collaborating and working with each other in construction. But the industry coalition that has been formed around the oldest bill is currently 83 trade bodies, representing well over half a million small businesses and sole traders. There's never been 
any such campaign formed on fair payments, whether it be in the construction industry, in the pub industry, or in the retail industry. This is the largest fair payments campaign ever created, and it's all been created behind Peter Aldous, including huge organisations that you, you do not normally see these guys work together, you do not normally see them plant their flags in the same field as it were, because they're big organisations, they want to be uh, known for doing their own thing. Institute of Directors, it shows that you've actually got your executive level people on board, they are interested in this, they think this is a good idea. British Chambers of Commerce and the FSB showing that it's good for small businesses and good for the economy. Even the Self-Employed People's Association, the Association of Accounting Technicians, the Forum for Private Business and the Small Business Commissioner. So there is a broad church of support here, which is very encouraging to see going forward with the bill. Because after Carillion, all of the inquiries, all of the investigations, the select committee hearings, all of the reports that are going to be published, the key message that we're driving to the government at the moment is that change has to come from what's happened. You know, there is a triumvirate of problems in the industry at the moment, in a post Carillion, post Grenfell, and midst of a housing crisis world, doing nothing is not okay and the industry needs to modernise and needs to change. The oldest bill is a very good way of driving that forward. There have been obviously a few consultations that we're looking at and that we are eagerly awaiting the publication of, especially the consultation on retentions. We were hoping that that would be published before Parliament goes on recess, but we will just have to wait and see on that. And Obviously there are a lot of very relevant consultations at the moment that government have for the industry and if you don't make sure that you always try and respond to these because actually it tends to be the larger companies that have the time and the resources to respond to these. If you want your voice heard as a smaller business you always need to make sure that you take the time to do these consultations. And that's generally a quick overview of the oldest bill, where it is, where it came from and hopefully where it's going. Uh, so this is an update on retentions and the alternatives uh, to retentions that are in the market at the moment. Um, retentions in the construction industry, what is the problem? Uh, the construction landscape at the moment um, equates to 10% um, uh, of the employment um, within the UK contributes 6.7% uh, to the economy um, and that's made up of over 280,000 businesses, no, over 99% of which are SMEs. So retentions are quite a pertinent issue within the construction industry as they um, affect mostly SMEs. Um, as we all know, retentions are uh, an amount of money, usually between 3 and 5% of the works already completed, um, that are held and retained um, by the party above as a security against defects within the work. Uh, typical position is that half of that money is released on practical completion of the works uh, and the following half released on the defects period. Um, under the Construction Act, uh, it's not legal now to um, uh, link the release of retentions to payment or certification under another contract, so payment paid or payment certified. The PITE report released in October 2017 identified three main issues with retentions. Uh, one being late and non-payment, two uh, the effect of retentions on relationships throughout the supply chain um, and three the effect of um, retained monies uh, on insolvency uh, when businesses go down, if retention monies aren't uh, put in a separate account or, re or retained in a trust of some sort, uh, that money is then lost on the insolvency of the people above. Uh, late and non-payment, uh, the, um, the PITE report uh, identified that an average of £27,500 um, was being withheld um, and lost through late payment um, throughout the construction industry at any one time. Uh, larger businesses suffered losses of 34,500, with smaller ones 27,700. Um, and the report identified that these practices do provide a barrier um, for investment, uh, productivity and improvements in growth within the industry. 
Retention is a one part of the fair payments uh, campaign and the issue around fair payments within the construction industry. Uh, all of the issues that you can see on the screen now, former jigsaw, um, retention is being one of them. The oldest bill focuses on um, how to deal with retentions, but until uh, all these different bits are, are looked at and put together, um, they're still going to be an issue. In terms of relationships throughout the supply chain, the PITE report identified that Tier 1 contractors reported uh, that it was a negative impact on their business retaining um, uh, retentions from uh, subcontractors. 46% uh, um, of businesses um, reported higher business overheads and 35% um, said that the cost of construction work was higher because they were holding retentions from subcontractors. Um, and then a further 41% reported that working relationships with their clients were weakened uh, due to this practice. Uh, in the case of insolvency, the PITE report identified that um, over 10.5 billion small uh, SME working capital is locked in retentions any one year. Um, and uh, up to £700 million worth of retentions have been lost due to insolvency over the past three years, which I think we can all agree is a lot of money. Um, the further problem with, the, with retentions and insolvency is that banks do not consider retentions security for lending as it's not guaranteed that that payment is going to be made. So what can we do to change? So retentions is a historic problem. Uh, there have been many reports across the years identifying um, in, um, retentions as bad practice across the industry. Uh, the PITE report was the first report to put actual figures to the issue um, and everything that we all knew as bad practice can now be um, looked at in numbers and data. Um, the PITE report led to the consultation on the practice of cash retentions um, and a further consultation on the effect of um, updating the, con uh, the Construction Act. Um, we are expecting those results soon, an interim report, hopefully before summer recess, um, although um, it's probably been delayed due to other uh, parliamentary considerations at the moment, certainly Brexit as being one of them. One solution to the issue of insolvency um, and retentions is to place the money in a trust account, um, something such like a deposit scheme, where the money is placed in a separate account uh, that is ring-fenced in the event of insolvencies upstream. This continues to guarantee um, protection for non-completion and defects, but also makes payments transparent and equitable um, throughout the supply chain. So it's clear that the industry is united that there is a problem with retentions, um, but currently slightly divided on the solution. I'll talk about some of the um, solutions and a retention deposit scheme as advocated under the Alders Bill. Um, ring fencing of monies uh, is, we think, practical because it uh, secures the monies to be released on time, um, increasing transparency throughout the supply chain. It would reduce the amount of, of monies lost due to insolvencies <laughs> upstream, uh, which as we saw before was quite a substantial amount of money. Um, allowing SMEs to invest in skills, technology, moving the industry forward, um, generally increasing productivity. Um, the further benefit would be that banks would be able to lend on this money to the SMEs as it's a guaranteed um, uh, form of security. Uh, the Elders Bill advocates a retention deposit scheme that would be based on the tenancy deposit scheme. Um, any, any costs uh, to the scheme would be funded by the interest earned on the deposits and any profits made would be invested, reinvested into the industry. Uh, the cost of implementing this kind of um, deposit scheme would be insignificant compared to the cost of keeping the system as it is at the moment. Um, there are some other uh, embryonic proposals um, such as an insurance top-up scheme, a retention guarantee scheme, such as the Lift Contractors Association operates. Um, it's small, uh, so it's unlikely to work on a larger scale, but there's also potential for a backed bank credit facility system. So what's for the future? 
There have been a plethora of consultations recently, um, such as the one on insolvency and supply chain payment issues. Uh, we are expecting uh, the release of the consultation on, re on retentions very soon, certainly the interim uh, report. Um, we're also um, expecting uh, the release of the supply, supply chain finance um, report out soon, which should, should include some interesting um, uh, notes on, on fair payment and retentions in general. Um, and the Alders Bull is now scheduled for a second reading on the 26th of October and as Alexi previously said this has gained quite a lot of um, cross-industry support and um, quite hopeful for the outcome of that. Um, I think it can be said that there is an appetite um, for change within the industry and it's just which direction we choose to take. Thank you very much. The issue of payment is a source of great controversy. The sums involved can be very large and the duration of projects long. Over optimistic pricing and late payment can cause cash flow problems for the supply chain. Payment, late payment, is often a source of dispute and can result in relationships breaking down and also cash flow issues and project failure. Government strategy over many years has been in order to support better payment practices and this continues with the government's construction sector deal announced earlier in July. The industry awaits the outcome of the government consultations on retention and payment and the Construction Act. Alexi and Debbie have talked about retentions in the Aldus Bill. I'm going to look at project bank accounts, which is another way of safeguarding retentions. So what are project bank accounts and what advantages do they have? Well, project bank accounts are a mechanism for First of all, security that the payment will be made without delay because payment is made directly to the subcontractors to the supply chain on a contractually agreed date. And also protection in the event of insolvency of the main contractor as the money is put in an account and ring fenced due to its trust status. The account itself is usually administered by the contractor. Uh, the contractor will usually choose the bank that sets up the project bank account and bear the cost of that account. Given low interest rates currently, costs of setting the bank account may not be recovered through its entitlement to interest. Recent changes to banks following changes to the retail and small business operations has mean that, means that project bank accounts are now seen as a more of a complex product. Uh, one bank I spoke to recently said that it would offer a project bank account to a contractor only if they had a turnover of more than £6.5 million. The employer usually pays in monthly an approved amount um, and it's more unusual for it to be pre fund the account. It doesn't, it's not intended to cut across the payment and certification process and if an, amount is, is, if an amount due to the contractor is less than an amount due to the subcontractor then the contractor is required to top up the account or payments are reduced proportionately. Um, the supply chain receiving payments are also parties to a trust deed. Uh, the quote on this slide is a quote from the government briefing paper um, in 2012 setting out the benefits of project bank accounts. Uh, the drivers for project bank accounts are mainly client based. Um, whilst it's been pushed by government, um, the JCT um, notes to the, the its former project bank account say that it's probably best suited to larger projects that can justify the cost of setting up a project bank account. However, the public sector mandates the use of public project bank accounts on um, certain projects. The UK government says that project bank accounts should be used unless there's a good reason not to, and the Welsh, Northern Ireland and Scottish governments have certain thresholds above which project bank accounts should be used. Um, Crossrail itself has committed over £5 billion to project bank accounts over its project lifetime. However, it's fair to say that the uptake of project bank accounts has been relatively poor in the private sector. And the question is whether the events of earlier this year will, will do anything to change that. So I wanted to quickly set out um, the actual process for setting up a project bank account and the contractual requirements. You either need operative provisions in the building contract or alternatively a separate agreement with enabling provisions and also a trust deed for the various parties that are intended to be paid out of the project bank account. 
So I've said about on this slide the difference between um, the JCT and the NEC approach to project bank accounts. The starting point is in order to have a project bank account as part of your project, you need to have either operative provisions in the building contract or alternatively a separate project bank account agreement with enabling provisions in the building contract. You also need a trust deed, which is, a, which is, a, which is between the employer, the contractor and the various parties that are in, hoping to get payment through the project bank account. Um, the JCT approach is to have a separate project bank account agreement, an additional party deed, and it's intended that there's an enabling provision in the building contract making reference to the project bank account agreement. It, the NEC approach is that project bank accounts are incorporated by virtue of sec the secondary option YUK1, and there's also a form of trust deed and a form of joining deed that are included within the contract package. Uh, the JCT and NEC deal with project bank accounts slightly different, differently. Um, the NEC approach is that the contractor is the sole, sole account holder and he has to top up the additional funds if there's a shortfall between what has been paid to the contractor and what is due to the various subcontractors. In JCT, uh, both the employer and the contractor are a party and the payments are reduced proportionately. This means that the subcontractor will have to pursue the contractor for the deficit. So, in conclusion, uh, project bank accounts, yes, they can involve a cost for the contractor, but also a cost saving for the project as a whole, and that's been demonstrated by their use to date. Um, they can also help reduce the risk by ensuring payments are assured and made on time. Uh, thank you for listening to our webinar. If you'd like to get into contact with us, our details are on the slide. If you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them.